Welcome to the 2020 GHSA Wing presentation. A lot is going on in the world in the off season. We hope that you and your family have been safe. Our goal tonight is to uh, prepare for the upcoming season. We, will, uh, we hope this presentation will be helpful in an effort to gain consistency within our line of scrimmage officials across the state. We also hope that this presentation uh, will help you individually grow as an official. Although you can't interact necessarily with us as presenters, uh, feel free to reach out to your uh, training coordinator for your association uh, or us individually. On the call, we have uh, Kenny Simon, we have Drew Scott, and myself, David Reynolds. Uh, we'd like to discuss several point of emphasis for the 2020 season. Although there will be several topics that are critical to the line of scrimmage position, today we're going to focus on legal formations, free kick coverage, forward progress, goal line mechanics, and keys and communication discussed throughout the plays. There will be a brief quiz at the completion of this presentation, so please make sure you're following along. Let's get to the plays. First topic we're going to discuss tonight is legal formations or le illegal formations. Uh, first play, we got a really good call for illegal formation, four, more than four in the backfield. Uh, also, a really good job by the crew to get two flags down on the ground. Uh, effective, com effective communication makes sure that we do have two flags on the ground. That really helps us uh, when it comes to discussing uh, conversation with the coaches about who should be off, who should be on. And so here we see, uh, done a really good job here drawing some lines, drawing some numbers. But we clearly have five in the backfield, more than four. Uh, there's no way we can make this legal. Kenny, you want to discuss some communication pieces here? Yeah, just, you know, and, 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 you know, you guys have been hearing it for multiple years. Give your partner some sort of indicator, right? Use your radio, tap your flag. You guys discussed this in pregame <clears throat> because we really want to have two flags down on this one. I um, mean, we know sometimes these teams rush out of the huddle, line up pretty quickly, but if you can communicate, um, do take the opportunity to do that. Two flags looks good on film. Uh, so here we cannot make this legal. There's no way that we can make um, the number one receiver at the bottom of the screen. There's no way we can make him on. Uh, this, this slot receiver right here, there's no way we can make him on. Uh, the bladed grass idea here, we got too much grass here to make that one of them on. So definitely a good call here for legal formation. Okay, same idea here. Uh, play number two, good call for legal formation, more than four in the backfield, same as the previous play. Again, effective communication allows for uh, having two flags on the ground and proper signaling. So if the headline judge at the top of your screen, he punches that receiver off. The bottom of your screen, the line judge is going to point, uh, punch the two back, number one and number two receiver. The bottom of your screen punches them back about both, both off. Uh, makes it really easy for us to understand that we do have uh, more than four in the backfield. So when both wing officials are punching them off, your receivers off, uh, that should be a flag very quickly to make sure we – um, have a problem there. Okay. Yeah, and and here as well, guys, when we report this, so I'm kind of beating the communications drum tonight, right? So um, you, you can't have uh, too much of it. And so when we report this, in this particular play, you know, it's it's just more than four in the backfield, right? And so that's what you give, you give that to your white hat. If, for example, like one of these linemen were, you know, making the fifth person, you know, it's more than four in the backfield, number 72 was in the backfield, right? Let's just, just add that little bit of clarification just so your white hat can explain um, if a coach asks um, and, if, and so that the rest of your crew knows. So let's just make that little distinction. You know, if it's more than four in the backfield and we don't add anything to it, it was mostly backs. Um, and if we say more than four in the backfield and the lineman made, you know, the fifth person, we need to go ahead and clarify that. Okay. Uh, and then kind of taking this play a step further with a wide angle. Uh, Drew's going to talk to us about making sure that we finish officiating the play um, before we go and run and back and report to the, to the referee. All right, so run it back a few times. What we're going to pay attention to here is at the end of the play, we're going to see two players that are continuing to do football activities. Um, in all honesty here, uh, I hope nobody throws a foul for that action. If anybody sees the block that continues, that ends up where you get a guy on the ground right around the 28-yard line. Uh, those are guys playing football. They're continuing to block. You know, nothing here is suspect, but – as an official, we have to be great dead ball officials. So 
we would expect here, rather than just, hey, stopping officiating, we'd kind of like to see you move in with some presence. I mean, if it gets really bad and you have the spot, drop a beanbag and get in there and make sure that we don't have something that escalates to a flag. That we can make presence and let the people know that we see what they've done. We're accepting that that's okay. If we let stuff like this go, we all know that stuff gets chippy and we start to see it pop its head up later in the game. So continue to fishing, guys. All right. So there we go. Another good call for uh, illegal formation, dead ball fish shape. All right. So the question becomes uh, kind of point of emphasis for this year. Uh, play three is going to show us kind of how we should handle a borderline illegal formation. Uh, this is the first punt play of this particular game. And we're going to look at the number two receiver, number two person at the bottom of the screen right here, uh, and number three at the bottom of the screen. And the question is, are they on or are they off? And um, we need to do a couple things. And we, the blade of grass idea has not gone away. Um, but the, the no man's land is still a thing as well. And so it's kind of the protocol for, the, for moving forward needs to be, uh, first time we see no man's land, if, he's, if it's questionable, if it's borderline, first time we warn them. Okay. First time we warn them. Uh, second time, if they do not correct the formation, then we need to have a flag down. And it's that simple. Uh, we've done that in the past with the left, you know, the, the tackles kind of being maybe too deep. Uh, we've done a really good job of talking to coaches to slide them back up. Um, but what we're seeing is some wing backs and tight ends, and uh, this might be the best play to discuss, but even tackles. Uh, being too deep, uh, potentially. So here, this kind of borderline. Uh, we can see the ball snap from the 25-yard line and, and the number two receiver, number two tackle at the bottom of the screen. He's at the 24, 23, and so we don't want to necessarily be too ticky, ticky-tacky, uh, but we do need to clean up the line of scrimmage uh, across the across the state. So, uh, again, the closer you get to the football, as far as a receiver, uh, the more legal uh, we need to be. So if they're out by the numbers, uh, then, yeah, that blade of grass idea plays right into our hands. It helps that a lot. Uh, but the closer we get the football, uh, the, the more legal we need to be. Yeah, so the easiest way to kind of remember that is those receivers outside, like you said, they get the blade of grass. When you move in, there is no blade of grass philosophy on linemen and backs. Okay. Uh, and so – Go ahead, Kenny. Let me just let me just jump in here, David, and say, listen, when we see this, this is this is early in the game, right? So again, communication. So let's let's sort let's warn the player if you're close enough to you know warn the player, you know, um, after maybe after the play, we don't want to tell players to move up or move back. We don't give those type of instructions to we don't we don't coach kids, right? But you warn the coach. You warn the player and you give your, your partner if, you know, he or she can't see it from, you know, from their side of the field. You go ahead and communicate this early to your partner, communicate it early to the head coach. We want to clean this up the first time we see it. One of the things we've noticed is that we, we will see crews warning uh, coaches, players, talking to the team, really working themselves a lot to try and get them to clean up the line of scrimmage. And we are going to tell them one time, and then we're going to flag it. You know, let's get it early and get it out of the game. So, Kenny, when you say warn the coach, Kenny, who, who are you going to talk to specifically? I'm talking to the head coach, right? Um, I, I'm not telling anyone else. I want, I want the head coach to know exactly what we're seeing and what we're not liking about what we're seeing. And it doesn't require a lot of explanation. A, a clean line of scrimmage is a fundamental tenet of the game. It is fundamental, right? These kids should know how to line up. You should coach them to line up right. If we see that they're not, we're going to warn you one time, and then we're going to flag you. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so on, on top of everything that's been said here is, I know a lot of you guys really want to know from an evaluation standpoint, you know, what are things that we're looking for? You know, how are we going to know whether or not, you know, there was a warning given? Well, it's – if we're live and we're at a game, then we want to see you go in there and talk to that tackle after the play if you can. We want to see that communication happen. In, this, in the instance here, prior to the play, David, go right back to the beginning there. Um, 
just to kind of, you know, show us that you're aware. I mean, get your angle. I mean, if you have to, I mean, kind of lean into the backfield a little bit there. You know, your angle, your head to see. If you can see through that tackle and you can see all the way past him in daylight and you don't see any snapper's rear and it's all the way clean, that's a flag immediately. But if you see that they're really tight, there needs to be a warning. We want to see that. How can we see that there's a, been a warning on in place when we're watching video? Is the first time, but the second time we expect them to be a lot cleaner. If it gets worse, then we're going to make the assumption that there was no warning given at all. Make sure you guys are communicating to those coaches and players. Don't get lazy with the with the radio. The radio is an excellent tool. But don't overuse it. Make sure that you're getting out there and you're doing the things you need to to make sure that the people get that message. Okay. And then the last thing I'm going to chime in on is uh, with the number one receiver at the bottom of the screen, as tight as he is to the line of scrimmage, uh, it really hurts the line judge on this play to actually see uh, where his tackle is if he does not move necessarily like Drew just said uh, or, you know, tell here's my foot and, and make it a smidge behind the line of uh, scrimmage. Top of your screen, your headline judge has his receiver. He's on, uh, but he has a much better view uh, down the line of scrimmage to where he can see. Uh, his guard and tackle much cleaner on this. And I, that's guilty. Uh, that happened to me this past year uh, where I had a receiver very, very tight to the line of scrimmage. I could not see the interior linemen, uh, and they were questionable uh, at best. So uh, he cleaned it up. Anything else on illegal formations or formations or protocols as far as warning first time, black next time? No? Okay, cool. All right, uh, like I said, Dr. Bodie again will have uh, some, some more videos discussing the rules of it uh, as far as legal formations. Uh, one thing, because this is a pump play, it's not a rules mechanic, but um, a, a rules uh, conversation. But remember, on a pump play here, a foul by the kicking team, uh, the receiving team does have options. It's not an automatic re-kick, uh, not an automatic decline. So make sure we remember our, our rules change. All right, let's move on to – uh, free kick, a mechanic change or update or however you want to call that uh, includes free kick coverage. Uh, this diagram is going to illustrate the zones of coverage. Uh, so no longer are you going to see a uh, line of scrimmage of fish, uh, the crew on the field having number one on the kicking team, number two the kicking team, three, four, five, whatever it is. Uh, you'll see the field divided up like you see on the uh, on the map here. A couple things to note. Um, this is kind of what we've already been doing if you really want to be true about it. Um, once the ball is being kicked, yeah, we had number one, but we're more focused on threats in our, in our zone, and that's exactly what we're going to keep doing. So uh, find that threat in your zone and officiate from there. Uh, one thing I will say is I'm not going to show the six-person mechanics here, uh, but for the line of scrimmage officials, the headline judge and line judge, it's the exact same mechanics. And so all you'll see the difference between the six and seven person is uh, with no back judge. Uh, the three up there have a little wider zones. Uh, similar to what the headline judge, referee, and line judge have. So uh, not much different there. Other note for this, uh, your zones are not a hard line in the grass. And so if, what I mean by this is uh, if the ball is kicked towards the headline judge's pylon and all 22 players converge on that uh, that side, uh, we, we'd expect that line judge to uh, officiate a little further over into midfield potentially, depending on, like I said, where the, where the threats go. Uh, the referee would also have his – his zone kind of shifted horizontally uh, as well. Also, if we have a pooch kick, obviously uh, we'd have less players deeper downfield. And so we'd expect the, the, the headline judge, referee and line judge for their zones to come upfield accordingly as well. Okay. Any, uh, any questions on, I'm going to show a couple of plays uh, to discuss uh, this particular mechanics change, but that'll be added to, the mechanics book as well have access to this, this diagram as well. Kenny, while we're talking about kickoffs, what what are you thinking about pre pre snap, pre pre kick? What are you thinking when you're sitting there on the pylon? So so guys, what we want to do is, you know, we saw this inconsistently. We didn't, you know, we didn't not penalizing folks, but um when you're down there on that goal line, um, first of all, let's, let's have a beanbag in your hand. Um, 
you know, as we get deeper into those playoffs, some of these kickers can kick, right? Um, and so, you know, you want to be ready to beanbag. And so what I'm thinking is a kick is a kick is a kick. We saw, I think it was three different state championship games this past season where, and, and Cruz did it differently. Some did it right, some didn't. That ball was, was muffed, you know, inside that two-yard line and bounced into the end zone. And we had some folks that, you know, did the right thing and called it a touchback because it's muffed, so it's still a kick. We had a couple of people drop a beanbag and get a spot where that ball was touched. So I'm just thinking, you know, a kick is a kick is a kick. Um, I want to stay on that goal line, you know, for a while. Let the ball get caught. Let the play go ahead and get started. If you are a yard or so off on a spot on a kickoff, no one's going to ding you. I'd rather you just be in a good position to see the, the runner or the blocks in front of the runner, the action behind the runner, whatever your responsibility at the time is telling you to do. Um, and so, you know, that's really it. Other than um, also get in line with your R. When that ball is caught near that goal line, um, I think we're pretty inconsistent on whether or not we're going to go ahead and kill that um, or not, you know, or let the, you know, someone's body may be in the end zone, but the ball is out of the end zone. Just have a conversation on that and let's lean towards killing it when that happens rather than letting them sort of take the ball out from the half yard line. Hey, Kenny, real quick. Um, what, what is the purpose of that beanbag? What are, what are we beanbagging? Um, are, yeah. we, are we going to beanbag a muff or are we beanbagging the possession uh, near the goal line and like momentum situations? Yeah, we are. It's, it's all about momentum, right? Kid is, you know, let's say a ball is, is, is sort of kicked at an angle, right? Kid is, you know, didn't think the kid, the kicker could kick that far and he's running and he catches, you know, a ball over his shoulder on the three yard line, but his momentum carries him, right? Um, into that end zone, we want to we want to beanbag that, right? And so, you know, we're not beanbagging muffs and things like that. This is all about you know um, momentum where that ball was sort of possessed outside of that goal line. So we have a question on the chat um, that says, "Only are we only killing it if it's in our zone?" It's an excellent question. Um, if if it is between you and the referee. I would definitely consider that between your zone. So yes, you would be the person that needs to kill that, you and the referee. We do expect in that situation where it's between you guys, for you guys to kind of have that ocular communication real quick to kind of look at each other, to make sure, because sometimes, you know, referee may give you a deer in headlights look, then you go ahead and, and you take charge. Or if you're not sure, you kind of want to lean to him. So make sure you guys kind of have a little uh, like I said, ocular communication before you guys go ahead. But that's an excellent question. If it's on the other side, then leave it to those, leave it to the other guy's zone to make that decision. And I'll, I'll add to that a, a, a hair. Um, it looks really good when uh, you have 22 players coming down and you have a touchback. Um, for wing officials to get off the sideline and help that referee shut that play down. And so it might be the referee's uh, primary responsibility to, to signal touchback, all that kind of stuff. But uh, coming to the 10-yard the line, uh, kind of showing – not having players go behind you necessarily, but kind of showing that presence. Um, that way, you know, some of us have been in very high-octane games where, uh, you know, a touchback might be – uh, a, a personal foul late and all that kind of stuff. So don't be afraid to uh, continue to officiate like we just talked about a few minutes ago, uh, prior to ball rotation, prior to going to the field and getting your chain set up, all that kind of stuff. Finish that play first. Okay. All right, let's watch some plays. Um, this kickoff going right down the middle. So we got a free kick right in the middle of the field. Um, and so we let play first, and then we'll kind of discuss some things. A lot going on here. All right, so mechanically speaking, like we said last year in camp, uh, we really want the line of scrimmage officials to hang on to that goal line as long as possible until it's no longer threatened. So it, the, the return happens, 
it goes upfield. That's when we leave the goal line. So right here, uh, we really like to – on this film, the top of your screen is your line judge. We'd like that line judge to be uh, straddling that pylon still right now. Okay. And as our turn goes, uh, we really don't want – our officials on the field uh, during really any any type of play, but especially kickoffs because the play might re reverse the field, that kind of stuff. So you bottom your screen, to your headline judge, uh, creeping on the field. Uh, we really want you to stay off the field, stay wide, better cone of vision, all the above, okay? Hey, so let me ask a question real quick too, um, go backwards a little bit, at least pre-kick. Uh, Kenny, David, whichever one of you guys want to take this, but where's your pre-kick position? I mean, are you – and I'll just say straight up, I really hope that you guys don't say that it's directly over top the pylon, right? I am at an angle, right? I am behind that 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 pylon um, at an angle. I am not turning and facing my partner. I'm turning and facing the kick at a 45 degree angle, probably, you know, a foot or so behind that, behind that pylon. Yeah, the, the goal there is, I agree with Kenny, the goal there is if it goes over one shoulder, it's touchback. If it goes over the other shoulder, um, if the kick's right at me, then the kick's out of bounds. And so I don't have to move a whole lot. I can sit there and watch the kick come to me uh, if you're in that kind of position. Does that answer your question, Drew? Oh, yeah. All right, so in our new kickoff coverage, uh, we're going to look at who should be looking where. Uh, and so, again, don't use those boxes as hard lines because here we have the line judge at the top of your screen. He's going to need to get in the middle of the field uh, a little bit to officiate uh, that block. We would expect the referee to pick up the blocks right in front of the runner, right down the middle of the field. And then we expect the headline judge to be looking and clearing the blocks at the bottom of your hashes as well. Um, so, again, kind of how this play develops, I'll slow it down for us. Especially if we have those either three or four people upfield, we know they can help us out other types of blocks. So we're looking in front of the football, in front of the returner, to, to clear those blocks. And so right here we could probably argue a block in the back that a referee should have had right there, boom, at the 18-yard line, um, or at least had knowledge of if this is a block in the back or not a block in the back. So we'd expect the referee to watch that particular block. Okay. Now, as the return happens, it becomes a normal return, a normal returning play, a running play, excuse me. Um, and so we still have the spots. We still do what we've been normally been doing on, on routine plays. But here we see the headline judge kind of shifting his uh, attention right in front of the runner. And then now, yes, we get the spot out of bounds, clearing the clock. Also, headline judge, don't be worried about coming around the runner. Uh, we can kind of come right up the sideline, let that play end uh, from a safety perspective, also kind of vision perspective, uh, trailing, that play, trailing that play a little wider, a little longer, wouldn't hurt us there. Okay. So one more, one more time from the top, kickoff right in the middle of the field, new kickoff coverages. Anything, Kenny or Drew, and then somebody else also said that they were working with mixed crews and the referee had them line up on the 10 yard line. Mechanically speaking, we can do that. Um, now the reason that it's in the mechanics manual is because sometimes you are just not going to have the kid that has a leg to kick it that deep. So, you know, if the kid doesn't have the leg, then, then change your position. You can go up to the 10 yard line. But what the comment was made is that they felt uncomfortable about moving up to that 10 yard line. Guys, Get as comfortable as possible. If you feel more comfortable with that goal line, then hang at the goal line. Now, if the referee tells you to do something, go ahead and be a team player and, and do what he asks you to do. Um, but, but have that conversation possibly with him during a downtime and says, hey, I, I just feel a little more comfortable being at the goal line. My cone of vision is wider. I can see more. But um, mechanically speaking, we can still line up at the 10-yard line if the kicker does not have a leg. All right, so next play, we get a free kick. It's a directional kick towards the uh, number at the bottom of your screen. Okay, oops, sorry. And that's kind of how our zones are going to shift a little bit. On this particular film, we had the headline at the bottom of your screen. So he's right up in numbers, uh, watching that guy come down the field. Uh, we have the referee 
uh, looking up uh, towards the hash of the numbers and the line judge kind of the backside cleanup already. And so that's kind of showing that directional kick. Again here, don't overrun the play. Don't be in a hurry. Uh, both wings on this particular kickoff return overrun the play because of the reverse of the field. Um, so, again, don't be in a hurry to get up the field. But there's your kind of your zones uh, as they shift on a directional kick. Anything else on free kick coverages for this year? All right, let's move on to forward progress. This play happened a couple of years ago, but this is a textbook play on forward progress. We need to do a better job of when it comes to forward progress. We need to make sure that uh, we give every player every yard that they gain and nothing more. We need to make sure we give every player uh, and team the time they deserve and nothing less. And so if a player is going forward and out of bounds, yes, we need to stop the clock. If the player is uh, being driven backwards and out of bounds, then, yes, we need, we need to keep the clock moving. This play shows uh, a very good example of what we should do. Uh, good job here about line just to wind the clock. Uh, we, we would want on a forward progress play uh, to signal that we are keeping the clock rolling, uh, especially as tight as we are late in the fourth quarter, as you can see. Uh, so, Kenny, you want to discuss, Kenny, you want to discuss some, some um, communication pieces that you prefer to have here? So the only piece I'll add in terms of communication is a nonverbal um, right here. Um, cross field mechanics like this looks good you know this guy is winding he is cool walking up to the spot and I'm hoping that his partner across the field or her partner across the field is standing on the exact yard line where that ball was possessed so that is still a form of communication even if we're not verbally saying anything but we would love to see if we had you know if we looked at the wide shot of this maybe that cross field partner or even walking out onto the field a little bit to say I got you you know, here's the spot right here, right? It's all good. Okay. Uh, now, with this crew, the learning moment here, uh, we're under one minute. And when we're under one minute, we really need to use one football. So, uh, still dead ball officiate, but as much as possible, uh, we want to use that same football. The player does not help us a whole lot uh, in this situation, um, but we need to have one football here uh, so we don't have two footballs on the field. And then 23 seconds later, we don't have a snap. You know, we have a problem. So um, just under one minute, learn a moment here. Under one minute, uh, use that same football as much as possible and communicate that as well with your crew. Under one minute, one football. And, David, last thing on this one, you, you know, you, you, you uh, Drew and I debated whether or not you, you talked to the coach about the clock status. I think, you know, the, the, the way this, this crew did this mechanically, it is obvious that that – you know, that clock is still running. He took his time, and he was winding that clock. I'm not looking for a coach to tell him that clock is still running. Okay. Yeah, very good. So I um, just want to add a little bit why we – go back a little bit for me there. If you actually try to stop it right when he catches it. So something that we got to do better forward progress, not only right there at the boundary, but also getting these drive back spots. It's the – if I was the official on this near sideline, I'd be running, and I would expect my cross field partner would have a spot for me right around the 29 yard line. I would expect that cross field partner to be able to pick that up. It's really hard sometimes for us if we're back to actually see that we don't have the angle to tell exactly where he got. The second point I want to make too is that if what we're seeing to him on video a lot is say you got a runner that is running along the sideline and he gets hit and goes directly sideways. Now, I've seen guys wind the clock like that. So if there's ever doubt whether it is, you know, whether he was going forward out of bounds or, you know, push directly driven backwards out of bounds, we kind of want to err with, hey, if we're not too sure, then stop the clock. But this is a really good instance where the guy is driven backwards, but his progress is 29, so we want to have a hot clock. So we got to do better there because what we're doing is we're mismanaging the clock when – a guy gets hit sideways out of bounds, and we're trying to say that he's in bounds. That, that is not a four bars. All right, let's move on. Um, same idea here, forward progress. We're going to play top of your screen. Uh, we have several pieces to discuss here uh, with the goal line, the line of the game, um, and then a forward progress spot here. So uh, we can see that this runner is pulled forward and out of bounds. Here's an example where we would expect the – uh, the run to end out of bounds uh, and the clock to stop because of that. 
And so um, kind of a good example and a learned moment there. Um, also can discuss goal line mechanics here. Um, that's kind of our next talking point. Uh, remember when the ball is snapped at the seven yard line uh, or in, line of scrimmage officials have it goal line. And so we need to work ahead of the play uh, to make sure that we can cover the goal line. Uh, remember that these guys are a little faster than most of us. Uh, so being more cautious, working further up the play of the field ahead of the play uh, is, is preferable. We need to communicate this pre-snap with our deeps, who has the goal line. That does not need to be an empty mechanic where you just do it to do it, okay? We need to do that to uh, trigger something in our mind to make sure that our responsibilities are, are, are correct, that we're in the right position, and they're able to signal all the, all the above. So, uh, Kenny, that looks familiar. Why don't you discuss some, some pre-snap thoughts here? Yeah, this guy looks familiar. Um, pre-snap thoughts here, um, you know, is there a line to gain? I can't tell you the order of your, you know, your pre-snap routine, but is there a line to gain? And in this case, um, there it is. You want to start deep. And, you know, you, you just, you know, you don't want to move that much, right? So go ahead and start deep. Um, stay in front of the play. Again, move as little as possible. Um, I like to check who are my eligibles. Um, and if I can get numbers, I like to do that because I want to move and think as little as possible about things that, you know, I should just sort of know. And, and, and you want to get still. I talk about not moving because when you are stationary, you can see a whole lot. It's like these plays that happen at the pylon, the people who just sort of spectate on the game, they look like tough plays. But when you are still and on the goal line, it's really not a tough play for you. You can see everything pretty clear, right? For example, you know, a uh, good mechanic to the goal line, standing pretty still, and sees that on this tackle, it's not a horse collar, but to some it may look like it, right? We used to call that sort of a clothesline or getting yoked back in my day. But, um, you know, what we have to do here, everything is good, but, you know, does not kill the clock. This guy is obviously going forward when tackled. And so the only thing um, we missed here is not killing that clock. Right, which depending on the, you know where we are in the game could be a pretty grave mistake. Okay, so we have another play here with goal line mechanics. Good job here again. The line judge bottom of the screen uh, go into the goal line right away. And, and what, again, once you get the goal line, you have a goal line. So don't leave the goal line until the play is over. So really tight play here at the boundary and the pylon play. Um, nice job of processing all that. So, Drew, talk us to us about uh, where you prefer this line judge to be with his toes and his heels. So, on this play, in, we want to see when the ball is, at, at the very least, when the ball is actually spotted on the hash nearest you, we would expect you that when you're inside that goal line area, that your heels are on the back of the white. Now, there may not be a back of the white, but there are little – little um, dashed lines that let you know about where that, that, that barrier is. So we want you to start deep so that way you're not having to angle backwards. So if you watch this guy right here, he's kind of positioned in the middle of the white, and then as the play gets a little closer, he's having to step backwards a little bit. So just start a little deeper so you're not having to take as many steps. Because Kenny talked about a little bit earlier on the last play about if you're not moving, you're going to see this stuff a lot better. So try to get to where you're as deep as you can kind of go. And then if you have to back up, make sure you have that area of the goal line cleaned up. This is an issue. And I don't know if you guys can see all the people right there, but that needs to be cleaned up prior to that play. So that way you have goal line extended and you're able to keep the integrity of that. This guy did this great job getting to where he needed to be. He had a good look. Um, but another little critique, which – really doesn't matter that much anymore. You guys have no reason to step up and give the touchdown signal. If you want to stay back and give it, it, you can stay back there and give it. So we see a lot of people that step up. Stay away from the action. Keep a nice wide angle. All right, let's move on. We discussed a couple of plays ago, line to gain and goal line. Here we have a fourth down play, top of your screen. Uh, we have a line to gain at the four-yard line and a goal line play here. And so, Drew, why don't you keep talking a little bit and discuss line to gain and goal line, who should go where, who should cover which line. Okay, so if you have the play in this situation right here, and the play is coming your way, watching what this official did right here was absolutely correct. 
We know that the line to gain is a big line, but our most important line and the one that we expect you to cover, if you have somebody else that's not a line of scrimmage official that's evaluating your game in the playoffs, they're going to they're gonna look to see that you have that goal line covered. So if you're working with somebody, like if I'm working with Kenny, Kenny and I, we talk about this prior to the game. We, we've talked about the situations. Hey, if it's a sweep to, to the top of the screen there, then the guy on the screen isn't going to call a touchdown from 50, 52 yards away when it's near the pile line. So that other official on the, on the other side of the field can kind of pause and help out with that potential line of game. But your expectation is to be at that goal line and goal line mechanics. You should be able to work backwards if need be. Now, it's really important that you guys read and react to the place, especially around the goal line. But keep in mind, again, you're expected to be covering that goal line. All right, very nice job. Speaking of coming out, let's go to uh, some reverse mechanics real quickly. Okay, and again, um, we know that at the three-yard line, ball down at three-yard line or in, both wings officials go to the goal line, go reverse mechanics. Uh, we also know that at the 10-yard line and in um, the headline judge, if the ball is threat, the goal line is threatened, should work back to the goal line. Here's the bottom line. If we're in shotgun and we're inside the 10, the quarterback's going to be threatening the goal line uh, pretty quickly. So headline judges uh, need to be moving a little quicker uh, towards that goal line for reverse mechanics. Really good job here uh, for the headline judge anchoring that goal line. Because the referee is not there, line judge not there. You see the headline judge coming in, signaling uh, correctly, um, safety. And we can't really criticize the ruling because he's in the right position. So he kind of makes that an easy uh, evaluation to be had. Drew, anything else? Uh, just this was a change that happened uh, about three years ago, two, three years ago. And we're still seeing a number of associations that are having the line judge uh, kind of be the primary in these goal line situations coming out. Now that it used to be, that was the mechanic. But now the judge is going to focus on holding that line. And he's going to be the person that's able to rule on whether the, you know, pass was behind line of scrimmage, beyond line of scrimmage, passer was, was beyond. So the headline judge, as I like to call him, is the runner. He's the one that will drift downfield, but he's the person that when goal line, coming out of mechanics, he's the one that's expected to officiate this play just as we see this headline judge. Headline judge. What I like about this play too, uh, Drew and David, is you know, this headline judge is 35 yards away from this play. Right? But because he is in the right position, he just, he has the best view of it all, right? Being that far away, being in the right position and makes the call, comes running in with the signal, this looks good. This is the kind of thing we want to see. It's very definitive. This is a safety all day. Didn't hesitate. This looks good. All right. Anything else on goal lines going in or going out mechanics? We're good on everything here. All right. Let's go on to some keys. And so uh, we'll look at seven-person mechanics on this play, and then we'll look at six-person mechanics on the next play. And really not a whole lot changes. Uh, between six and seven person, we actually get a little bit of help from the back judge when we do have a seventh person back there. Um, but we know that on a double double here on a balanced formation, uh, that the back judge would have the number two receiver at your bottom of your screen. We know the uh, headline judge at the number two at the top of your screen. We know the line judge would have the back and also the tackle. And so the the, the formation is balanced. Uh, the back judge will key off the line judges. Uh, side. So some of us have been on different fields where the headline judge might be on the press box side, all that kind of stuff. That's all irrelevant. It's where the line judge is. That's where the back judge is coming to help out uh, as far as keys are concerned in the seven person mechanics. Um, I'll just play run and then we can discuss, you know, switching keys and, and how long we should stay with our keys um, because it should matter. All right, so play down the field. How long should we stay with our keys? Well, at the top of your screen, we're going to get a switch pretty quickly. With the outside receiver coming down across the middle of the field, the headline judge will pick up that receiver. Uh, because the other receiver goes downfield, we're going to let that be the side judge's key. 
Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you don't really have a switch yet because they're both going downfield for the most part. Uh, and let the deeps handle that. Drew, you want to talk about the line judge's responsibility here with that running back or and tackle? Yeah, so go all the way back to where you've got your labels there. Labels. So the line judge being the near screen, he is expected to get that back, even if the back is on the other side of that quarterback. Now, that back goes low. I mean, that's going to be tough for us at times to possibly get that. Sometimes the referee can help us, but, you know, that back will go into that crowd of mess and, and possibly cut somebody. That's a primary key. So we make sure that we can try to find an angle. If you have to, as a line judge, take a step backwards a little bit, try to get that angle, you got to do what you got to do. Just all while keep in mind exactly where that line of scrimmage is so you're still keeping, uh, basically the uh, integrity of that line of scrimmage intact. You are expected even going across the field there, other side of the quarterback, to, to cover that line judge. Now, going to very beginning of the play, pre-snap key, you know, pre-snap key is the back, but that doesn't mean that we're looking in the backfield until that ball snapped. Make sure we don't miss any false starts, and you're, you're definitely going to have to help out on the tackle over here because you have the referee on the near side here, and he's looking across the quarterback to where the H is. So you need to be able to pick up both the tackle there and that back. Right. It's even tougher when we move to six man too, because now all of a sudden you've got a lot more keys. So Drew, to your point here on this particular play, the back, the running back and the defender kind of get some hands to the neck or head or face mask or somewhere semi high. So uh, that's definitely something that we would have to be responsible for right there at the middle of the field. Yeah. Yeah, you, you would be expected to be that primary because that is your key as soon as the ball snapped. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next play. We need a motion da here. David, yes, real quick, I, I want to go backwards just a little bit there and, and talk about switching keys. Go ahead. You guys all need to remember that you really shouldn't switch your key until it clears the threat. So looking at the top of the screen there, you, you, you see those guys cross? There is no threat. You don't need to officiate air. Now, had that uh, guy that runs basically kind of above the scene there, if that outside linebacker right here or safety maybe open the box or whoever it may be, if he goes and putting his hands on him and is riding his hip, then, then you're expected there to stick with that guy until he clears him and until he's basically in that, in that field judge or side judge's zone. Don't come off a key until you know that he's free of being fouled. Okay, a good point. So next, next play we get a motion. And again, when do our keys technically start per se as far as passing around and that kind of stuff at the snap. And so when he motions, yeah, he starts with trips to bottom of the screen. Uh, when he motions to the top of your screen, the ball is snapped. We still have – a double double balance formation. So the exact same situation we discussed on the previous play. Six person mechanics. Let's talk about that for a brief second. Uh, we know that the line judge now would have the inside receiver as well. So just one more responsibility uh, for us. The, the field judge would have the number one, side judge would have number one, headline judge number two. Um, so there's your kind of your modification there for six person mechanics. Okay. And David, also here, six-man mechanic-wise, you know, we know we're looking at a couple of things. If you're that line judge at the bottom of the screen, because we still have to get eyes on on this back. And so, you know, we, we talk about threats, right, and sort of monitoring and clearing those threats. If I were you, I'm watching the receivers, you know, that maybe have threats if, if, if you know, DBs are walked up. Um, then I'm probably watching those guys first. If DBs are playing 10 yards off, but a linebacker walks up on the edge of the line of scrimmage and is going to blitz, you know, or in this case, like, you know, you had one that, that sort of blitzed, then I'm probably going to, you know, just keep your head on a swivel here because, you know, we know it's a little tougher, but in six-man mechanics, we still want you to be able to, you know, pick up on some things that might be um, need to be flagged. All right. Uh, next idea with keys, uh, we're going to have number two and number three here. Let them declare. 
so a couple of things that actually helps us here. One, there is no threat, like Drew was talking about a few minutes ago. They're 10 yards off the ball, so uh, we're not terribly concerned about them once they line up legally. But we're going to let them declare as far as let them run their route, what zone they go to. Do they run, does one run a hitch route, and that becomes a line of scrimmage official? Does one run a post right toward the back judge? One run a flag route to the field judge? Kind of let them do their thing. Uh, so we'll, play. we'll have a, um, a screen. And so uh, we'd expect the line judge to be primary responsibility for the receiver who kind of sits down and catches the pass. Um, and then the back judge picks up the block inside, the field judge picks up the block outside. Yes, the line judge can also help once the pass is caught, the line judge should still be looking in front of the runner, um, but they might be coming on kind of late depending on how clean that catch is uh, with that pass. As far as punching this lateral pass forward versus backwards, um, Drew and Kenny, y'all can hate me or, or help me. Or It's a preference if you want to punch forward, uh, but if it's backwards, you have to punch backwards. And, again, the mechanics are not changing. The line judge is responsible for all punches uh, from sideline to sideline in the back foot. Does that – y'all agree with that? Yes, he is responsible for punching backwards passes. It is completely um, – there is no mechanic that says you must punch forward passes forward, but you are expected to punch backward passes. If you feel comfortable punching forward, feel free to do that. Nobody's going to care whether or not you do it. So whatever you feel comfortable with, just make sure if you're the line judge, you punch him backwards on backwards passes. So, so me being the beating that communications drum, you know, I, I like to see, you know, it forward. I like to just see that line just get in the habit of, you know, immediately assessing whether this is forward or backwards and just punching, right? So if you know, I, and so I know I like to see it. We don't ding you if you don't, right? But it just looks good to me when that ball is caught behind the line of scrimmage, and you know, you have a nice little punch forward. You feel, it feels like you're locked into me, and you. Um, you know, and you're watching what you need to be watching. Right. Last idea for trips. Um, let's just pretend like that's enough of a stagger, enough of a uh, separation for the three at your bottom to not call it a bunch. So the field judge has number one, your bottom. Line judge has number two. Back judge has your number three, the bottom of your screen. On this particular play, your, your referee should come over here and help you with your near side tackle, the trip side tackle. Um, and so the headline judge would have that running back and also the backside tackle. Again, ideally, we switch very quickly uh, to keys uh, because the number one receiver catches the pass. But again, like Drew said, uh, we don't we should not switch keys until we clear uh, that block, that contact, that threat around that receiver. Um, there's your trips idea. And again, if we were six person mechanics, uh, take the B out, put an L on them, put number three there on your inside receiver. A little more responsibility uh, without a back judge. We got time for one more play, Drew. Yeah, so uh, can you go back one step? Because we're going to talk about partner um, officiating on that play, about um, potential switching keys and who we're really responsible for. Because I know you have the labels there, uh, kind of a bunch set there, but – what do we do with bunch sets? What, what, what should we really do in terms of how we officiate that? We're letting them declare first. You got to let them declare, right? So the second part of this play, too, is that this is a potential OPI play. Um, now, now you're gonna, if, if you're going to be able to make that call, whether or not you have a receiver blocking three yards downfield and the pass caught the online scrimmage, and you're able to make that play, as a line of guy, then you're on your way to work on Sundays. But for the rest of us that aren't that good, we do want to have conversations prior to the game with that deep official we're working with. We want them to know that, hey, if it's, you know, if you've got a receiver that's blocking downfield and it appears that ball was pretty close, we want them to throw the flag and then we will pick it up as line of scrimmage officials if that pass was thrown behind the line of scrimmage. So it's a two step process. So make sure that communication happens prior to the game because this is one that it, it can be very tough for a line of scrimmage official to do all by themselves. 
All right. The last idea is kind of add on here, uh, but communication is big, but also dead ball officiating and having that presence. So on this play, uh, as far as ruling intentional grounding versus uh, not intentional grounding, uh, we really like to see the covering officials line to this play, uh, kind of point to the receiver that he thinks in the area code. The referee does, which he really should not ever, um, but kind of does our job for us. So we prefer uh, on the film to see the line judge point to whoever he says wants to be in the area. Also, if, he, if we can see him reaching for his radio, that way we know he's communicating, hey, number eight was in the area. Um, that also might be a good thing to have there. But uh, here's an intentional ground that we prefer to see a little more uh, communication piece to it. And, David, I'll add in there, um, you know, depending on where this ball is thrown, you know, if it's, if it's in between that, you know, that line judge and that, you know, uh, and that field judge, um, it, it, it looks good if two people are pointing, right? And so um, we're not trying to force that, but someone needs to identify the wide out in the area. And when that ball's thrown a little bit, you know, a little bit deeper there, it would be good to see both of those guys pointing, you know, at, you know, the nearest receivers in the area. This is, uh, to both y'all's point, this is one of those times where you want to sell this call. Because you're going to get the fans in the stands that think, hey, there should be a flag for intentional grounding. And by you getting out there and you showing, you know, pointing, then you're helping your officials on the other side of the field when the coach is screaming and chewing him out, saying there's nobody over there, that you're pointing and making a basically a show out of, hey, you got somebody right there. That helps out the other officials on the field as well as in, in high school football, we don't have a referee that pops on the mic and says, hey, number eight was in the area, there is no foul for intentional grounding. We don't need that communication. So our communication is that point. That call. Okay. Uh, anything else? For, anything else we want to discuss, men, tonight? David, I think I think if we get these things right this year, it just you know put the, the, the caliber of officiating is just getting better and better every year in Georgia. Um, and so if we get these things right and we see this a little bit more consistently, man, it's just it's just much better. We clean up that line of scrimmage and fix some of these things. Um, you know, we'll see a lot more crews moving up, moving on. That concludes our presentation for the 2020. Georgia High School Wings Breakout. Please make sure to take the quiz that will complement this video. Feel free to discuss any material with your association training leaders or reach out to one of us. On behalf of Kenny, Drew, and myself, thank you for attending and good luck in the upcoming season.